Hey, it's Mason, back again with another episode of Audio Architecture. Today I'm talking about cables. You know, nowadays, the future is heading towards wireless technology. And as much as I'd like to live in a cable-free world, cables can either make or break your studio. I wanted to make a video with all the different types of cables that you're bound to come across in a studio setting. This video will include a little bit of information about the functionality of each of these cables I have to show you today, and whether or not they're worth having in your collection. I'm also going to be including some recommendations of cables that I personally use in the studio. Hopefully, this will be a useful point of reference if you ever need to know what a particular cable does. If you were to use the most basic kind of cable for music production, you would run into some problems. Simply put, a basic cable has two wires, a signal cable and a ground cable, running alongside of one another within some insulation. Now the alternating current coming from the wall socket is 60 Hertz, commonly 60 Hertz in the United States. This means any electronical equipment you have in your studio will emit sound at this frequency. Therefore, if your cable is unshielded, this hum can produce an annoying sound during recording and could potentially be heard on all your tracks at 60 Hertz. This is why we have shielded cables. Instead of running side by side, the ground wire surrounds the signal wire to stop the hum completely. A shielded cable is low power and high impedance. These cables are usually associated with instruments. That means they're built to carry a weak or unamplified signal. For example, they can bring signal from a guitar to an amp. On top of this, they are made even more lightweight and flexible for better functionality on stage. These type of shielded cables are therefore not what you want to use in other types of situations, such as carrying the already amplified signal from your guitar amp to your speakers. That's why you might find unshielded speaker cables with much bigger wires to carry that amplified sound. There are other exceptions when it comes to unshielded cables, but today I'm gonna focus on shielded cables that you're gonna find most commonly in a studio. Both types of wires, unshielded and shielded, are usually unbalanced. This means that even the most protected and shielded cables can pick up some noise interference. You can get away with this for some instruments, but for things like a vocal microphone, you want as little external noise as possible. Some cables are built for balanced signals, while some others are built for unbalanced signals. In addition, some cables can be used for analog purposes, while others are used for digital purposes. Let's start with the cables most commonly associated with analog equipment. The cable you will come across most often in a studio is the XLR cable. This has a balanced connection and is used in situations where a secure connection with minimal noise is desired. These are often called microphone cables. The input consists of three pins providing a positive, negative, and ground connection. Another common cable found in the studio is the quarter inch instrument cable. This is a shielded cable and is often used to connect guitars to amps. These cables have been around since the late 19th century and if you look closely at the jack, you'll see a single black hoop just below the tip. These are called TS cables or tip sleeve cables. There is only one ring, which means that this cable has a mono connection. The TS cable is an unbalanced cable. Quarter inch TRS cables or tip ring sleeve cables. They're a lot like TS cables, except these are stereo cables, meaning that they are capable of carrying a stereo signal. The TRS cable also has two black rings instead of one and is a balanced cable. TRS and XLR are the two most common balanced cables that you're gonna find at any studio. You don't often see a stereo set of TS cables. It's very rare that you will need an unbalanced stereo quarter inch instrument cable, as most amps are in mono and most instruments are only capable of playing in mono. But there are always exceptions, which is why they make a set of unbalanced stereo TS cables. 
Is it likely that you're ever going to use these? No. Which is why I would advise simply using TRS cables. Here we have a combination of balanced and unbalanced connectors. I've got a cable with a quarter inch connector at one end and an XLR at the other end. These hybrid cables come in handy for certain situations, but are fairly uncommon for everyday use in the studio. So I won't go in depth about these in this particular video. There are two more analog cables that I'd like to go over today that are very common. Starting out with RCA cables. RCA cables usually come in mono pairs. These are used commonly in consumer and audio stereo setups. With these cables, the tip carries the signal and the ring is the ground. In PA systems, they're often used to connect a stereo CD player or other consumer electronic devices to the mixing board. They usually consist of a pair of wires molded together with separate ends color-coded for the left and the right channel in stereo devices. Some mixers also have RCA outputs for connecting to a recording device. The term RCA is derived from Radio Corporation of America and these cables are unbalanced connectors. Let's move on to digital audio connectors, which are required for linking digital mixers, recorders, preamps, and DAWs, digital audio workstations. The first type of digital audio connector is the DB25 or D sub cable, also known as the TDIF cable. It can both send and receive up to eight channels of information with a single cable. This is outdated technology and most people have upgraded to USB and MIDI cables. MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface and MIDI cables allow electronic instruments to communicate with other devices. These don't transmit actual audio, but MIDI technology defines the sound in the receiving module by signaling every aspect of a musical performance. So it can communicate the note uh, how long the note is held, the velocity of the attack, and control the functions to softwares and synthesizers. This gives you the ability to control sounds and tones with a remote control surface. USB cables are the most common type of digital audio connection. They have become the standard for connecting digital audio gear. These cables are newer technology than the DB25 or the MIDI connectors. This supports a greater number of channels, and there are multiple versions of this particular cable. They're designed for communication and as a power supply for computers and other electronic devices. This cable is called a Firewire cable, which is another common digital audio connector that is used to transfer data to external hard drives and transfer audio and video at higher speeds. HDMI has become the standard for connecting consumer electronics, such as DVD players and gaming consoles, its ability to transfer uncompressed video and audio signals has led its adoption into the pro audio gear. Optics cables can transmit digital audio as pulses of light, but cannot handle higher resolution formats. The ADAT light pipe cable is the widely accepted standard for digital audio transfer on optics cables. These can carry up to eight channels of uncompressed audio using fiber optics and are capable of surround sound as well. The next optics cable is an audio protocol associated with different consumer gear. The Sony Philips Digital Interconnect Format Cable, or SPDIF cable, is used to interconnect components over short distances. These connectors look like common RCA components, but these cables are not interchangeable with analog RCA cables. Last but certainly not least, the power cable is one of the most important cables in the studio. These are built to power most gear and plug into any standard outlet. When it comes to cables, it's easy to get caught up with the different kinds of connections that can be made. It might be hard at first to find signal flow. So tune in for the next couple of videos to find out how and where to plug in. Thanks for watching. See you next time on Audio Architecture.